present them and discuss them. I'll start with verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So that you are in samples uh, to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Okay, what we've done is um, section this out into certain uh, topics that we're discussing. You know, we talked in the overview last week that this was a new church. It was beginning to undergo persecution uh, that Paul was an example. And having left that church, we saw in Acts 17, he was kind of pushed out, pushed out. Uh, they threw him out, literally, from that area. And uh, he's inquired of Timothy, they suppose, and Timothy's gave him a report about this church. And that leads to Paul penning this letter. Now, the first section we'll look at, and this is how we'll split it up tonight, as we look at this chapter. Um, the first three verses of Paul's salutation and greeting. And, um, and then we'll center in on verse 4 concerning the issue of election and what that is. And, and then we'll really, after that, that center, go to the last verse concerning what it means, that issue of waiting for the Lord and what he's delivered us from the wrath to come. So let's look at his greeting. And, um, and if we're just kind of sticking with your outline, we, you left, we left blank spaces there so you can fill them in. May not do that every time. But I'm thinking in terms of the source of our peace. You know, and so remember he's saying here that grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the source of grace and peace is who? God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, grace is what? Amen. Just write that in. It's unmerited favor. Well, being unmerited, what do you do to get it? Nothing. It's freely given, isn't it? So that means no action or work that you or I could do, no sacrifice, no gifting, no philanthropy, any such thing can get us favor with God. He's freely given us by grace salvation as a free gift. Now, if you're right in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10, says there, by grace are you saved through faith. Amen. And that not of yourselves. So it's not of us. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we have nothing to boast of. Our boast is in Jesus and what he did for us uh, to save us. So grace is unmerited favor. And peace is what comes into our life as a byproduct of being saved. You know, one of the things that we did, you know, peace to us in the world, generally with nobody messing with you. You know, you know, you're looking for peace. But on the inside, we had no peace about our eternity, our I walk with God. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore now being justified by faith, we have peace. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. And the word peace here, when you look it up, it's simply a word that means it's irene in the Greek. But it's a result of being justified. To be justified is to be treated by God just as if I had never sinned. You know, in other words, there's, when I have that peace, irene, it, mean, it can mean prosperity. Um, 
It can mean one or it can mean quietness, you know, from the point that nothing's bothering me. I'm not perturbed by anything. You know, I've got peace uh, in a physical sense. Um, but the definition I like, and all of them in your strongs under the irony, it means set at one again. That's the definition I like because I believe when we're saved, we're set at one back in our position that God wants us in. Amen? You know, and so we have peace with God. We also have one, oneness or unity with our fellow servants in Christ Jesus. Amen? Because by one spirit, are we all baptized into one body? So there's only one body, amen, of Christ in the world to which we all are members, isn't it? So we're set at one in that way, corporately, as a body. We're set at one, you know, as it relates to our lives, amen, the peace that we now have as a result of being made right with God through Jesus Christ. Paul also went on to say that because of this, you know, uh, as he gives this opening to them, he thanks God um, for them making mention of, you, of them in his prayers. We find that theme in Paul's epistles as well. Paul's a praying man. He's praying for the church that they grow and develop. But as he prays, he says he's remembering without ceasing. And these are the characteristics of this church in Thessalonica. So when we look through this list, Notice this is a young church, but this church has some really good things on, on, the, on, on the go for it. They, Paul remembers their what? Work of faith. So they weren't lazy believers. Amen. Paul actually said concerning them uh, that they were becoming known for um, uh, their faith around. Notice verse 8. He says, from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God would is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. So here's a people in a church, and this is a Gentile church. You know, Jews are there, but this is primarily Gentiles. And so Paul is noting here that they are known by their fervent faith. So he remembers without ceasing their work of faith. And because they have faith, what else are they doing? He remembers their labor of love. And so they're working, they're walking in the love of God. They're demonstrating the fruits of the Spirit. And, um, and so they also have patience. Now, remember, faith work it by love. So, and, and so they have patience, or actually patience of hope in our Lord Jesus. And so um, that's something we need right now, isn't it? Patience of hope. And all this craziness that's going on right now, if you don't have patience and hope, amen, if you don't have a belief in you, what is hope? Um, okay, expectation. Okay, so it's an expectation concerning things you do not see. Um, and that calls to man Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. You know, and so if we have real faith, we have a favorable expectation concerning our present day, but especially our future. Amen? So we can go through all this craziness right now in patience, which is endurance and hope, because we know at the end Jesus is glorified, we come out on top. Amen. How, we know how everything ends in the end. And so it's not falling apart. It's coming together. Amen. We're the last day's church. We're going to see some craziness. We're going to see people faith get crazy. We, we're going to see folk depart from the faith. We're going to see people uh, become mockers and say, where is the promise of his coming? We're going to see people begin to mock and persecute us and lie about us and translander us and blame us for all the world's problems. Amen. But if we have patience and hope, amen, we can endure it and favorably look to the coming of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. So we need to have this in our lives, don't we? Patience and hope in our Lord Jesus. Amen. And what about Jesus? Patience in what about Jesus? That he's coming for us. Amen. That our salvation is secure. Amen. That the one who began a good work in me, he's going to complete it. And so my eternity and my destiny is not based on the externals around me. Amen. My hope is not in the world. 
and I th think we're fanning there. Our hope can't be in, in the politics of men and, and looking to people. We got to look to Jesus. Amen. And so he is the one that we have our hope and our patience uh, toward in the sight of God and our Father. Amen. And so that comforts us. Now, it needs to be in the person of Jesus. Amen. You know, some people have faith in their faith. As if the, their faith alone is, no, faith has an object that we trust and believe in. That's the person of Jesus. Bible speaks in terms of faith toward God. Amen. And so Hebrews chapter six. Amen. So we need to operate in faith toward God, knowing that God's word, his promises are true. Knowing that irregardless of what happens in the world, God's made a way for his people. Amen. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we're not to fear like the world does. Amen. The Psalm, Psalm 23 says, I fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. That rod and that staff, they comfort me. See, this has to be our attitude in the middle of this. Now, I, I tell you about me now. I get, I don't like to see certain things happen the way they are. Um, I get a little worked up about some of the things I see. Amen. But at the end, in the end of the day, amen, these are things that we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We know that things will happen the contrary to the people of God in the last days. So we're going to keep our faith in the person of Jesus, trust his promises, amen, and look to him. And when it looks dark, I don't have to see. He sees for me. He said, I will lead thee, I will guide thee with what? Mine eye, amen. So I don't have to see the end. All I got to do is follow. Amen. Hallelujah. And see, that's one of the neat things. We have an inbuilt uh, system. Amen. You have an internal GPS, the Holy Ghost, and he'll lead us and guide us into all truth. Amen. You know, and so I, we just need to be good followers. And I think better followers now because we can't see our way around a lot of things. But as a shepherd, Jesus is going before us. So we don't go anywhere that Jesus hadn't already been. He's already foreseen it, and he's already plotted a way of safety for us, his people. And to me, that gives me hope, and I can be patient in the midst of this stuff that's going on. Amen? Anybody got a question, comment? Because this is where we are right now. If not, notice verse 4. Now, he says also, knowing a lot of our patience, a lot of our hope, a lot of our love and a lot of our faith needs to be undergirded with a knowledge. See, Paul said being justified by faith, we have peace. But Peter also talked about, um, let's go here for a second, 2 Peter chapter 1. It's good, you know, Hosea 1, 6 says, God's people perish for a lack of what? We need to know some things, don't we? Amen. Now, he says, grace and peace, verse 2 in 2 Peter chapter 1, be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. See, we can have God's unmerited favor toward us. The good news is it can be multiplied toward us. The key to it being multiplied is what we know about God. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Wow. Amen. According as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the what? Knowledge, knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue. We don't know about verse 4, the exceeding and great and precious promises, except by the knowledge of God, which comes through the word of God. So, that kind of clues me in. We got to get more in tune with God's word even more. Amen. Amen. But he's talking here, however, about knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now, we want to park here for a little bit because we need to know some th things about our election in God. Your salvation wasn't an accident. Amen. You know, God knew from the foundation of the world that there would be a point in our lives well, we recognize our need for Jesus and we stop trusting ourselves and our works and we fall on our face and call on him to save us. Now, the good news in that, you know, we feel like we chose God. but Actually, God chose us. Amen. We just found out that he did. Amen. You know, now concerning this issue of election, however, there's a lot of confusion in the church world. And that's why 
we're going to park here just for a moment because we find in the church world, and I kind of put that here in your notes, that throughout history, the church has struggled concerning the issues of election and predestination under salvation. You know, um, some, the one group is called Arminian, um, Arminianism and another one's called Calvinism. Amen. But um, um, one believes that um, in, in total free will, the other one believes that you are predestinated to be saved. And there's error in both camps. You know, now, what am I? Am I an Arminianist or am I a Calvinist? I'm a Biblicist. Amen. In other words, you know, you want to get caught following Calvin. That's what they call today Reformed theology. And it actually led to, in Switzerland, Calvinists actually putting people to death because of you weren't of what they call the elect, but did it matter? You know, and so there's errors in both sides of the camps, but there's a balance there. So we want to look at what election is because Paul says, knowing that brethren your, your election of God. So what is election? You know, now it's right down your notes, but if you don't look, what is it? <laughs> Might be why I left that blank. It's the Greek word ek loge. Um, it kind of roots out in a word that Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. We call the church the called out ones. Well, this word here means chosen. Or it's the divine selection. And see, so it says, knowing their brethren, beloved, you're being chosen of God. God, in his foreknowledge, selected us, chose us under salvation. Now, when it comes to Calvinism, they go to an extreme where they have like five basic principles of Calvinism. Now, all Calvinists, a lot of us picked up Calvinist beliefs, and we didn't even know it. We won't even say it. I don't know where we got them from. But how often have we talked to folk and you try to witness to them, lead them to Jesus, and they say something, well, uh, if it's God's will for me to be saved, I'll be saved. How many of y'all heard that? So either it's God's will for you to be sa saved or on the flip side they're saying, if it's not, I won't be. That would fall in the camp of Calvinism. Now, then we have other people who are saved that may uh, kind of put it like, if it's for me, it's for me. <laughs> now, not necessarily. Salvation is for all men. All men don't get saved. Amen? So Calvinism basically is built on five um, key principles, and it's, it is uh, symbolized by the acronym TULIP. Now, all Calvinists are not five-point Calvinists. Some are three, some are four. But in the Reformed theology movement, which is really growing in the body of Christ today, uh, more and more, John MacArthur is a five-point Calvinist. Uh, R.C. Sproul, five-point Calvinist. You know, people that are familiar to a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, being a five-point Calvinist, this is generally what they believe. They believe in TULIP, which is total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Now, what in the world are those things? Well, basically, it's based on this term, election. And basically, if it's, good, if it's God's will for you to be saved, nothing you can do about it. Somehow or another, he's going to drag you into the kingdom. That's irresistible grace. You know, total depravity means that in a nutshell, and then I come back to the outline, is that if it's God's will for you to be saved, if it's not, no matter how much you want to come to God, you can't. Unless he regenerate you and stir in you a desire to come to Jesus. That's why I say when it comes to a belief system like that, on the fringes, it can be very dangerous. Amen. And so uh, since it's prevalent in the body of Christ, we kind of want to look at it. Amen. Limited atonement means Jesus didn't die for everybody. He only died for the elect. What? Yeah, that's what they believe. Now, we took some time some years ago, and we taught on that quite a bit. But the good news is, is that we can counterbalance these things with the word of God so we can see what the Bible says. Are men depraved? Yep. The Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Amen. You know. There's none that do it good, no, not one. Well, in that sense, yeah, depravity 
you know, you can connect that with sin. We're all born in sin. But in their terminology, it means without any desire from God unless God regenerates you. Biblically, regeneration is a new birth. It's only used once in the scripture, you know, and what, where the Bible talks about regeneration in that sense. But it means you're saved. It doesn't precede salvation. So Calvinism wrongly teaches that you have to be regenerated and then drawn to God for salvation. Bible doesn't teach that. So total depravity uh, is false. Go to John chapter 16. And if I could, let's, re let's read these verses here. John 16, verse 7. And this is kind of what they base this belief system on. John 16, verse 7. And these are things that can happen when we simply take the word out of its contextual setting and we don't balance it and compare it with the rest of the word because the Bible teaches us we're to compare spiritual things with spiritual. Notice verse 7. Amen. And this is the counterbalance what the Calvinists teach because when they say that you can't come, in a sense it denies a key ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's why I have down there. It's false according to John 16 beginning with verse 7. Because why has the Holy Spirit come? Verse 7, John 16. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient or necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. When did the Holy Spirit come? After Jesus left. And when he has come, he will do what? Reprove the world of sin. That means convict or convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Why of sin? Because they believe not on me. So if the Holy Spirit came after Jesus left, we know he, his ministry on the earth toward believers and unbelievers began on the day of Pentecost, didn't it? Amen. Then he's come to convince the world of sin and their need for Jesus and of sin because they don't believe on Jesus. That's the thing that drives people that don't know Jesus to seek out false religion. God has put it in the heart of man to seek after him. Notice of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And so what I see here is that even though man left to himself may not have a desire toward what he knows is God. He has a inbuilt desire to seek God, God sent the Holy Spirit to draw men unto himself. We all believe this, right? Amen. You had to recognize you were a sinner before you got saved. What about unconditional election? Amen. If God chose you, you will be saved. Now, they do have um, some scriptures that they lean to that uh, move in that particular area, and I think I'll draw up a couple of them. And uh, because it can be dangerous to us or to them, you know, go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. First book in the New Testament, amen, praise God. Matthew chapter 10. And um, what we'll do is use some rebuttal scriptures because we know it's God's will that all be saved. And so if they say, and I think one of those is based on, hold right there, you hold there. I'm going to go to John chapter 6 and see if I see some. Okay, this is one of the Calvinist's favorite scriptures when they say that um, unconditional you're or chosen by God and you have nothing to do with it. John 6, 37. It says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no ways cast out. That's one of their text scriptures for the fact that you're unconditionally chosen of God. And if you just look at that one scripture, it'll seem that way. All that the Father gave. Now, if we look at that in the context of Scripture, Jesus died for how many people? 
because that leads to another um, thing that they teach called limited atonement, which we'll come to in a minute. But um, going back to Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, here's what Jesus said on the subject. Whosoever therefore, the key is the word whosoever, confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. You know, so Jesus, what he says is different from what Calvinism teaches. And so we have to go with what Jesus says. So it's not unconditional selection. Amen. Um, God has chosen us all in Jesus. Anybody got a question about that? Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Yeah. I got, I, got it, I got it right on the end. 32. Matthew 10, verse 32 is on the sheet, however. Notice 1625. Somebody read that for us, please. Mm-hmm. And a servant as his lord. If they call the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? I think I gave you the wrong one there. Matthew 10, 25? Matthew 10, 16. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Hold on, hold on, y'all. I get there. Okay. <laughs> 16. Okay, gotcha. Okay. 16. I thought it was me for a minute. Uh, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if, okay, 25, for, whoso, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Okay, and, and the key word again is what word? Whosoever. Somebody else read Revelation 22, verse 17. The reason why I'm emphasizing that is because, you know, even though God has chosen us in Jesus from the foundation of the world, um, there is a response from man that God requires. We're not shut out because, you know, you don't, even though God is chosen, it's not in the sense that the Calvinists use it, where if you want to be saved, you cannot be saved unless you want to be elect. Revelation 22, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that hears say, come, and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Amen. Now, that's just in the mouth of two or three witnesses right there. But it's the whosoever will. Amen. And so when p people are told that if they're unconditionally elected, you know, then if you're not, you can't be saved is false. Uh, and then we also put down a reference there, John 3, verse 15. And... Um, John 3, 15 is another one of the scriptures I really love. And it's another whosoever. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, the thing that gets us saved is whom we pl place our trust in. The whosoever is any person who believes in Jesus. Amen. That God raised him from the dead. Amen. That he died for our sins. Amen. And so... It's not an issue of unconditional or those who were selected unconditionally being saved. Salvation is for all. Amen. What's 1 Timothy 1, 4 say? Somebody read that for us. What God's will is for all men. We, we recite it in our prayer when we're praying for nations. Who will? How many men? All men. So it's God's will to save all. And so it's not a select few only called the elect. We'll look at the different words concerning the elect in just a little bit. Um, and so I just use those as scriptures to refute that, type, refute that type of belief. Now, people that are a lot more learned than I, amen, for some reason seem to miss those. Or if you say you're saved, then you must be one of the elect. No, 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 no. I'm one that believes. And my belief made me one. He had already chosen us in him. God has predetermined that all men be saved, conditioned on their response of faith to Jesus. See, that's the condition. Amen? 
So another thing this group teaches then is limited atonement because God has predetermined who will be saved. Jesus died for the elect only. I've heard a lot of them say that. And, and um, maybe you have. Well, how would I refute that? Well, 1 John 2, 2. Now, I don't know if the apostle took time to go through all these things, but, you know, we have the opportunity to. Amen. But notice what 1 John 2, 2 says concerning Jesus. He says, and he is the propitiation. That word means mercy seat. That he is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the elect. The who? The whole world. Amen. So Jesus, he paid for the sins of the whole world, not just a group of people called the elect. Hmm. Amen, somebody. Amen. Notice 1 John 3. Notice John 3, 16 to uh, 17. And these are really familiar scriptures to most of us if we, we've been saved for any time. Because everybody's familiar with John 3, 16, right? <laughs> and he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So there again, the whosoever that believe it. See, God has paid the price for all men through Jesus Christ, but it's conditioned on our response in faith to believe in what Jesus did. Amen? And that's why we need to believe on him. And if we do, whosoever will, let him come. And that person can drink of the waters of life freely. The Holy Spirit is already working to draw. Amen? And when people aren't preached the word of God, you know, they'll mistake that drawing and they'll use that same faith to believe in false religion. Amen. We're built to worship and people will worship something. Amen. Notice Colossians 2.14. Could you read that for me, um, Sister Burke? Colossians 2 verse 14. Amen. I'm sorry. Go back to 13. Amen. So all of our sins were nailed to the cross, his cross. Amen. Hallelujah. And so the price has been paid for us. You know, it's not limited. It's for all mankind. Because in our talking to people, you're going to run across people that don't know if it's God's will to save them. You know, these are scriptures we can share with them concerning the fact, yeah, it is God's will. You know, if you simply believe, he'll do it. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter five. And uh, I read verses 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And he that died for all, that they which live shall not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, that them as being all in it, and rose again. It's for all men. We could find scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture that Jesus died for the whole of humanity. Notice John 12, verse 32. I don't know about you, but I like this. Amen. We used to sing this all the time when I was growing up in church. Amen. You know, Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will what? So if he's drawing all men through his death, burial, and resurrection unto himself, where does that leave limited atonement? It's untrue. It's not true. Amen. Salvation is clearly for all. Um, the next one is irresistible grace. What do you think? What would you guess that means? Uh huh. It would mean that regardless of how much you would want to be saved, you would have to be saved if God wanted you to be. Irresistible grace. Yes. That's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. That, you know, your salvation is so much up to you, it's whether God chose you to be saved. 
And, um, and if you're chosen, you will be, and God will make you willing to come. And, um, you know, but that also means if it's, if it's not God's will, no matter how willing you are, it's not for you. And I've actually heard some Calvinists say that, you know, that there are people that cannot be saved because Jesus did not die for them. And some of these people you need to listen to closely because they sound so good. But they said, well, Jesus died for the elect. He knew in his foreknowledge who would come to him, and he died to pay the price for their sins. And we've seen over and over again that Jesus died for the sins of all mankind. Amen? Hallelujah. And so it's not that he, in that sense that they discuss it, the Bible says, amen, that um, he'll draw all men unto himself through the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank God for that, too, that he'll draw us all to himself. Matter of fact, the present day ministry of Jesus is a draw man. That's John 16, 7 through 11. So that's what he does in the world today to draw people into himself. The last one in that um, tulip is the P, perseverance of the saints. Now, when you go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, When you get there, say amen. Remember, we're still in First Thess- We're looking at First Thessalonians one four, knowing your election. And notice here, the second part of verse thirty-two in Matthew ten. I think I wrote the wrong scripture down. That's not the one I'm looking for. Mm. Man, first mistake I made today here. <laughs> Let me see if I got it right here in my other, my little side note. Um, 1032B. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before me, and him will I confess. Uh, that's not quite what I had in mind there. Amen. I'm going to quote the scripture. Amen. He that endure to the end shall be saved. That's the one I was looking for. <laughs> Can somebody look that up? Where Jesus may. Now, I think that would be in um, the Olivet Discourse. But Jesus talked in terms of he that endured to the end would be saved. 23, could you read that for us? That's it right there. Now, 22, not 32. Okay, he that endured to the end shall be saved. That's the scripture they base this doctrine, perseverance of the saints, on. What do you mean perseverance of the saints? Um, That if you endure to the end, you're saved. If you don't, you weren't one of the elect. The, The fastest growing movement in the church right now is what they call reform theology. This is a synopsis of what they believe. That would place salvation under the area of works. That you keep you saved by whether you persevere and endure. And the two I mentioned are just a few of very famous teachers that adhere to that belief. And and so we could easily get influenced by it. Why do you say that's false? Because we're not saved by our endurance, we're saved by faith. Amen? Amen. Philippians 1.6 says, he who had done, began a good work in you will do what with it? We'll perform it, which means in the Greek, accomplish it until the day of Jesus. It's he that keeps us. Amen. Jesus said, they that the Father giveth me are whose? Mine. And no man can pluck them out of my hand. Amen. And so we're saved, but it's by the power, uh, power of the indwelling Holy Spirit that we're kept. Amen. He keeps us. Amen. 
You know, the Bible says if we're not faithful, he yet abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. He said he would keep us. Amen. And so that means, saints, my salvation isn't as easily lost as some people think it can be. Amen. You know, you know, and so once I'm in, I'm in. Amen. Now, we're not talking about actions that people do, but salvation is not based on works. He gives me the power to do it. Amen. He's the one that keeps us. Faithful is he that call it you. Oh, let me go. That's First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 24. Faithful is he that call it you also will do it. Amen. Do what? Verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the what? Unto the coming of the Lord. Amen. Faithful is he that call it you who also will do it. He will keep us. Amen. I thank God, amen, that, you know, he's energizing us to stay with him. He gives us the power to, uh, to walk with him and serve him. And so it's not based on whether I persevere or I run out of my own ability. God empowers us through the Holy Spirit to walk the walk through him. And so we need to know some things about our election. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Amen. And this is where... Um, when we read it in the context, it's plain, but when people pull it out, it, it can confuse them. Ephesians chapter 1, and I'll read and then we'll come in. And I love Ephesians. But in Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle says here, I was telling Junior earlier when I... Um, was preparing the outline, I flipped the page in my study Bible and it had a whole big section on predestination and election. I was going, man, I could have saved me a lot of time. But um, anyhow, verse <laughs> 4 says, look at this. Let's read verse 4 and 5 in Ephesians 1. According as he had chosen us in him. Stop right there. He's chosen us in him. Chosen us in him before. Let's keep reading before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. See, if somebody stopped right there and says, see there, pastor, that's election. We were chosen. You know, we got the irresistible grace and all these things working together. I was chosen in him. But you got to keep reading. Amen. So if we go down to verse 12, and let's pick up reading there together, then we'll see the balance between predestination and election. It's God's will that all men be saved. He has predetermined. Jesus died for all, Paul said. I thus judge. Amen. But all aren't saved because all do not believe. So there has to be a balancing of the two. The price is paid. The Holy Spirit is drawn, but it requires a response from men. So the Arminians say free will. We do have a free will as a free moral agent to act on what God has promised us in his word. And when the two come together for us, our free will along with God's choosing us, and we hear the word that gives us the faith, then we're saved when we call on Jesus. Amen. Let's read this uh, beginning with verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. What? Wait a minute, we just read earlier that we were chosen and predestinated. Amen. But it requires our trust first in Jesus. We see the balance? In whom, verse 13, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So we understand. That's why I say it both to the extreme or in error, but there's a balance between the two. God has chosen us to salvation. Jesus has paid for our salvation. However, we need to know his will in it through the hearing of his word. And in response to that word in faith, we call on Jesus and we are saved. See, it's not rocket science. I don't, you know, I don't know why theologians get bent out of shape. 
over stuff like that and begin to preach it, if we just stay in the balance of Scripture, we always come out fine. Anybody got a question on that? Uh, predestination, election, free will? If not, we'll move on. But that's the balance in it, I believe, is knowing what the Bible says. And then there's a couple other things we need to know. I have it in your notes that it's conditional upon your response. Um, and I wrote down Romans 10, 13 as well. One, you always hear me when I lead someone to the Lord. I always quote that scripture. Who shall, uh, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The precondition is that they believe that God raised them from the dead. Romans 10, 8 to 10. Amen. So God's choosing along with our faith and our repentance and calling on Jesus equates to us salvation. salvation. Amen. Hallelujah. So another thing concerning this word elect, two other ways this word is used. Um, it's God's people. The Jews are the elect of God. What does that mean? We call them the what people? Chosen. Chosen. <laughs> That's all it means. Go to Isaiah 42, verse 5. Brother Moon, could you read that for me? You got the mic in your hand. Amen. Praise God. 42, verse 1, and that'll make it easier for us. Isaiah 42, verse 1. No, 45, verse 4. Isaiah 45, verse 4. Jesus quoted that scripture, by the way, in the New Testament. You were, as soon as you hear it, you'll recognize it. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel's main elect, I have called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Amen. Could you read that one more time? For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have seen... I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, thou, th though thou hast not known me. Amen. You know, and so he goes on to talk about the smoke and read. Jesus referred to this as well. Um, but he's talking about the Jewish people. Isaiah 65, 9. Can you read that too? The Jews, in that sense, they are called the elect. In all of that discord, Jesus talks about it, except for the elect's sake, those days will be cut short. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servant shall dwell there. Amen. So that's clearly the nation Israel, isn't it? Amen. They are. And now remember in all of that discourse, Jesus is talking about last day's events. He's talking to the Jews and he says, except those days, except for the elect's sake, all men will perish except those days were shortened. Well, before Jesus comes at his second coming, at the end of the tribulation period, if he didn't come when he did, all the world would be destroyed. But for the elect's sake, because God is dealing with the nation Israel primarily you know, that's the time Jeremiah 30, verse 7 says, is the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved from it. Amen. And so, you know, it helps us to get a, a clear understanding of those type things. So the Jews are the elect people through which the Messiah came. You and I as the church, we are elect in the sense that God chose us in him. When we read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, according as he had chosen us, that's the same word. We are the elect. He had elected or selected us in Jesus before the foundation of the world. Saints, it was always God's will to save all mankind and that the Gentiles would be saved. When Jesus was being dedicated, it was prophesied that he would be a light to the Gentiles. Amen. Somehow or another, the Jewish nation missed it. Amen. In that respect, because they didn't understand that salvation was for the Jews until Acts chapter 10. Amen. But God had always said it was his desire to bring all men. What did God tell Abraham? That in him, all nations would be blessed. That's Jew and Gentile. See, it was always God's intent, and God spoke it so from the very beginning. Amen. And so God had already selected. But the Jew were the chosen instruments through which the Messiah would come, and he chose or se selected us all out to salvation should we respond right way to the preaching of the gospel. So we need to preach because how should they hear without a preacher? And how should they preach except they be, be sent? Amen. 
That's what Romans 10 says. So, you know, God has a way to get the word out, but we're the instruments that he uses, isn't it? Amen. Now, Isaiah 42, verse 1, could someone read that? Because the third group of the elect the scripture talks about is the Lord Jesus. Amen. And uh, Jesus is called the elect. Isaiah 42, verse 1. And that's the scripture he quoted again in the New Testament. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold my servant whom I un unfold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Amen. So we know this is talking about God's servant, Jesus. And he called them what? Man elect. So we see three groups of those who are selected or chosen. The Jews, the instrument through which Messiah will come, the Gentiles who were called to salvation, and the instrument, Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. So we see this here in these texts. And I went through all of that to show you that we need to understand some things about election. Just in case in your witnessing, you run across somebody. And I know we don't have time to go through a whole discourse like that when we're trying to win somebody to Jesus. But we need to un understand for ourselves when they say, well, um, if it's God's will for me to be saved, I will. You can quickly show them something like 1 Timothy 1, 4. It's God's will that all men be saved. And then are you one of all men? Well, if they say, well, I'm a man, but I believe I'm a woman. Well, you still in mankind. You can be saved. Amen. Because if you're walking, living, and having breath, no matter what you are coming to Jesus, he can deliver you out of that. See, he died for all. Amen. Well, I don't know, man, God. I don't see where God could save me. Well, we saw in Colossians chapter 2 that he's forgiven all trespasses. Man, I murdered, I did this. But all trespasses include murder, doesn't it? Includes adultery, doesn't it? Includes lying and slandering and whatever you could name. That's under the category of all transgression. So we just put those things in us so that when we need them, they can come out of us. Because there's a world out there where some people think they're beyond God's grace. Mm-hmm. That they've gone too far, done too much, and have no way back. Saints, we have the answer. Amen. You don't know what I've done. Doesn't matter. Jesus knew. And Jesus hung on that cross and he took your sins on his own body in the tree. That you being dead to sin could live unto righteousness by whose stripes you're healed. And so what it gives us more and more is a working knowledge of Scripture because those that are against us, they're well-educated in their error. And they are trying to use that error to undermine our faith. In closing, for the sake of time, um, another thing I note, and this is one thing I mention from time to time, if you look for the Trinity, some people say the Trinity isn't in the Bible. If we look for the Trinity, we can find the Trinity in every book. Amen. But pastor, the word Trinity in there, the concept is. Amen. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so I just like to do that because there are a lot of people, they, they're oneness, aren't they? And then there are a lot of them that are modalists. What's a modalist? Anybody know what a modalist is? A modalist is a belief system that what we call, they don't believe in a Trinity. Motors believe that God the Father acted in creation and God the Father is the Son and that the reason why the Holy Spirit could not come until Jesus left is because he left and came back as the Holy Spirit. You know, that's modalist theology. T.D. Jakes believes that. He's a modalist. And so there are a lot of famous people that are modalists. Miles Monroe was a modalist. You know, a lot of famous folk were. Were they, were they not good teachers? Yeah, someone taught very well, but that's what they believe about the Trinity. But then what do they do with the part in the Bible that said that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father then? I, mean, I have they, no clue. I mean, <laughs> But when you look at oneness theology, that's what they believe. Yeah, that Jesus left and he came back in another form. He can't be in the right hand sitting up there with But Father. that's what happens when you don't keep Scripture in context. One thing you'll notice about any group that believes wrongly about Scripture is that they have certain selected verses out of their setting, out of their context. Amen. And so when you 
quote something like, well, Jesus at the right hand of the Father, they wouldn't know what to do with it. I always like to bring up Matthew 13, I mean, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, where Jesus was baptized. Remember, Jesus said, well, baptize me, John, for thus it suffered that I fulfill all righteousness. And when John baptized Jesus, what happened? You know, well, we have Jesus. Father spoke and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Right. And when God was speaking, Jesus is going down in the water. And who descends as a dove? The Holy Spirit. That's them right there. That's the triune God. You know, and so it's not, you know, and so anytime you lift it out of his set and you can. So I don't know how oneness believe what they believe, but it's based on taking scriptures out of their setting and going by the teachings of men rather than the teachings of scripture. I don't care who it is. Never exalt what they teach above the word of God. Amen. Amen. And there are many places where we see um, the Trinity here. And here we notice, notice in 1 Thessalonians, Paul opens in his salutation. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, where's the other person of the Godhead? Verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so there we see, you know, and so in this book, like any other, you're a fan of triune God mentioned. The three in one. Amen. And Paul goes on to say that they became followers of us, verse six, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Matter of fact, in the Trinity, they have different functions. Amen. Which, um, we don't necessarily go into on the night. But going to verse 10 as we get ready to close. Well, verse 9, Paul again talking about this people. Verse 8, he talks about their faith being sounded out. Verse 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned from idols to serve the living God. That's repentance, isn't it? That also lets us know he's writing to a Gentile audience because if they were Jews, they shouldn't have been serving idols anyway to serve the living God. But then he notices when they turn, you know, and this, I believe, includes us as well. Once we've turned from our former way of living, we should wait for his son from heaven. Remember the blessed hope, the theme of looking forward to the return of Jesus is thematic in this book. And I don't know about you, I'm looking more and more to Jesus coming. Amen. You know, that's our blessed hope. That's our comfort, the Bible says. You know, we went to Virginia the other day, Sister Burke had an appointment. And when we got back, I was coming up on the carport and I heard this. I, I sounded like a trumpet to me. But it seemed like it wasn't coming from a direction. And I was going, you hear that? And Junior said, I hear it. I said, sound like a trumpet, don't it? It was like, Whoa, it was getting louder and louder. And I went to get Brenda. <laughs> I was getting ready to go, you know. She said, that's an airplane. <laughs> well, we're still here, so it wasn't the last Trump. <laughs> But that sounded like a trumpet to me, and it sounded like it was just piercing the air. It was louder before you got to the door, though. But, it was, but both of us heard it, and I was going, wow, that is strange. Um, but, you know, I started getting excited. Yeah, I mean, and, and I was excited, wasn't I? But I was, I was looking at the sky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but we need to have an expectancy, don't we? Because we are that generation, I believe, without a doubt. Amen. People say, well, you know, we got a pessimist that's in the world right now. You know, they always been pessimists. But what makes this different now is that we're seeing these things after Israel's back in the homeland. You know what Jesus said about that, right? After Jerusalem is the capital once again. He said that generation wouldn't pass away till we see all things fulfilled. So for the first time in history, we're having the things we're seeing along with that sign. 
And so that lets us know just how close we are. We don't know a date. We don't know an hour. But we certainly are in the season. And so knowing that, no matter what goes on, it can only be temporary. And then I had a thought the other day, even those that don't believe in a rapture, they're only talking about a three and a half year difference for most. Because nobody denies the rapture. The issue about is, is when does it happen? Yeah. Whether we get caught up in the three and a half year point or at the end and then come straight back down or pre-tribulation. Every group in that sense believes that we'll be caught up. But Paul says here, and to wait. That word wait means to await for his son from heaven. I wrote in my note, rapture. Amen. I did get excited the other day. I, I cannot deny that, you know, but, you know, just to hear that sound. Because that someday we're going to hear it. Amen. You know, no shout came with that one. <laughs> you know, but at some point in stage in the future, we're going to hear that shout and the trump of the archangel. Angel. And what's going to happen to us? We're going to be caught up. Amen. Praise God. I always wanted to fly. Praise God. I'll get a chance, I believe, to go up. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Define gravity in Jesus' name. See, y'all don't ever think like that. Man, what would that be like? I'm rising up and I'm looking down. Amen. And before that, the graves open, doesn't it? You know, we might actually see that before we get caught up. Because the Bible says those of us that remain won't prevent or hinder those that are asleep. Because what happened? The graves will be opened and the dead in Christ will rise first. Amen. So I kind of believe we'll see that. Praise God. Amen. And when we see that, you know you're going. There might be somebody that's dead in a grave and our house is built on it. That won't stop them from coming up. Amen. Praise God. And when I see them go up, I'm going up. Praise God. Amen. You know, that's going to happen for us. Pastor, that's a fairy No, it's not a fairy tale. The Bible says that. Amen. And so we're to wait. Now, this term wait means with an expectancy. Remember, the Bible says he's coming for those that. What about his appearing? Love his appearing. Amen. So we need to look forward to this. Every generation lived in that expectancy that Jesus could come, but the timing was off. But we're always supposed to live like we wanted him to come. Because when he does come, whenever he comes for us, it's instantly better. And we'll ever be with the Lord. It'll be bye-bye world, goodbye. Amen. And when we come back, it won't be to the same world that we left. Amen. Glory to God. So we're to wait from, for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Amen. That's the part I like. Amen. That word delivered, I have it in your notes. Room on a uh, room on a he. I know that's mashed up, but it means to draw to oneself. I think rapture. Amen. He's going to catch us up. He's going to draw us to himself. Now, later, later on, Paul uses a Greek term, caught up. And that's the word hapatso. It means to be snatched away. Amen. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. But we're to look and wait for the sun from heaven. It's part of our blessed hope. And notice what he delivered us from, the wrath which to come. The wrath to come. And so... Um, the hope of the church, thematic in these letters, is our blessed hope, the rapture. Amen? Now, there's more than one type of being delivered from wrath. There's a personal deliverance from wrath. And what do you mean, Pastor? Well, when we go to John 5, verse 34, as a result of being saved, I'm no more under condemnation. See, we were all sold under sin. Our end result outside of Jesus was Condemnation, huh? But thank God we repented. Amen. Notice what Jesus says in John 5, 24. Let's read this aloud together. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. 
That condemnation is the wrath of God. God is going to punish all sin. Amen. And that means every person who does not repent and get saved, there's a price to pay in it. The wrath of God. Amen. You know, it's not God's will in any parish, but they all come to the knowledge of the truth in it. But if we don't, you know, there's an eternity of separation in a place called hell. Amen. Thank God that's not for us. Amen. That's where those who are forsaken of God, amen, departed, separated because they didn't repent and receive Jesus. But the Bible says God didn't make hell for me and he made it for the devil and his angels. It's not God's will that any person go, which means it's God's will on the flip side for every person to be saved. Amen. I like the way one person put it. You have to literally run over and jump over re repeatedly the warnings of the Holy Ghost to go to hell because he's trying to turn men away from it. That's why, his, that's why Jesus came. Amen. Hallelujah. To, to lead us, to draw us. Amen. And so there's a personal wrath that, or judgment that comes on sin. You know, and so um, I thank God that's not for you and I. You know, thank God. That's not something we have to fear. How many of y'all used to fear the judgment seat of Christ? Amen. You know, that's not, that's not anything for us to fear. That's the beam of seat. <laughs> Amen. It's the other one that you would have had to worry about, the judgment seat. Amen. You know, but thank God. Amen. At the beam of seat, we're simply judged for what we do in our body after we're saved. That'll determine our reward in heaven. See, after we are saved, we can't get saved by works because Jesus did a work to save us. Once we are saved, however, the works we do will be judged by our motive. And in 2 Corinthians 5, that determines our level of reward in heaven. That's our incentive to do right after we are saved. Amen. And then we build on the foundation of, of salvation works of wood, hay, and of stubble. But what we do, and people put it this way, only what you do for Christ will last. Every other work that was done for selfishness or vainglory or for the love of men, all those things are burned, but you'll be saved as though by fire. But you'll lose reward. You're still in heaven. That's the beam of seat. That's the judgment seat. That's for believers. Amen? The one in Revelation 19 is for the dead outside the Lord. Amen? That's not our judgment. See, we've gone from judgment. We've passed from death unto life, but we'll be judged for our works. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay. The Bema Seat. Verse 10 says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Hallelujah. But thank God, when we get there, we're in, but it's a judgment of our works. Amen. And then there's a future wrath to be poured out on the world that rejects Jesus. You know, nations are going to be judgment, judged. There's a sheep judgment and a goat judgment for nations that Jesus talked about. The basis of their judgment would be how they treated national Israel. Hmm. And, um, but then the tribulation period is an outpouring of God's wrath. Jeremiah 30, verse 7, a time of Jacob's trouble, but he'll be delivered. A time where God's wrath is poured out on a Christ-forsaken world. And at the end, the armies of the world come in rebel rebellion against the Lord himself. If we ever read Revelation 19 and we get to about, about verse 7, we see Jesus descending. I like to try and imagine that scene with my limited imagination. And the armies of the world gather together against our Lord, Jesus. It won't be a long battle. Be very short. Amen? Then Satan will be bound and for a thousand years and we'll go into a millennial reign and after that they'll rebel again. But after that they're forever separated. But thank God we are delivered. Amen. From the wrath to come. Amen. 
And so, to me, that's a hope. Amen. Praise God. We'll stop right there. He's delivered me from the wrath to come. And you, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Any question or comment at the end? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. I know now to be the white throne judgment. Right. I mean, um, I never heard of a Bema seat. I mean, I, I didn't it, it was like everybody was going to the white throne judgment. You all standing there before God, and then you get sent. Either you go to heaven or you go to hell. Amen. And that's kind of the way we let that hang out there for people. Yeah. Because I thought that. How many of y'all thought that too? You know, I didn't know about a Bema seat judgment until years after I was saved and <laughs> reading through scripture. And it was kind of based on a theology that was in a lot of churches, salvation by works, unfortunately. But um, when we see the great white throne judgment in um, Revelations 20, Notice in 20, verse 5, and then we will close for real. Verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus Christ and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished, This is the first resurrection. Blessed is holy, blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection. On such the second death had no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. See, all of us are in the first resurrection. You know, now, when we read Satan is released after the thousand years, and this is after this, when He's punished forever, beginning in verse 10, that we come to the great white throne judgment. So there's a first resurrection, all the righteous dead in the Lord, including those in the tribulations are part of that resurrection. Second death has no power. Death is separation, right? So then we come, verse 11, to the great white throne. And I saw him and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the whole group that's in the second death. The Bible says we're in the first resurrection. On them the second death has no power. So we were wrongly taught, I was as were you, that we will all go to the great white throne judgment. No, we're judged for our works as believers. It's not to lose salvation. It's for inheritance and reward. Remember, there are different positions in heaven. Remember, Jesus says some are have cities. It was based on what they did. <laughs> Their faithfulness. Amen. I guess we need to do a teaching at some point called, and I said it before, inheritance and rewards. You know, Jesus did all the work to save us. The level of reward we get in heaven is based on our service to him. Hmm. Everybody don't get the same level of reward. We all have the same opportunity for service. Amen. There are different crowns for believers too. Be thou faithful unto death and you receive the crown of life. Well, none of us died for Jesus. We don't get that crown. There's a crown for those that love his appearing, that look forward to his coming. Hmm. We ought to get that crown. Well, if Jesus come, I don't get a chance to do everything that I want to do. There's nothing I want to do. Amen, more than. <laughs> I didn't always feel that way. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, well, let's call it a night. Amen. Praise God. And let's receive our offering. Dear Lord, we praise you for our time. We give you glory for it, God. And as we 
uh, receive our offerings, God, and Tad, we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. And God, we pray in Jesus' name that you are stirring us in expectancy, Lord, even and more for your soon appearing in Jesus' name. And God, we ask you to help us to uh, plow ourselves, remember our days, God. Give us a greater burden to stand in truth and to share it in Jesus' name. And the opportunity we ask in the name of Jesus. And God, we praise you for it and give you thanks for it in the name of Jesus. And God, we also bless the offering, Lord. Increase every giver tonight, God, as we receive it. Minister supernaturally to every need in Jesus' name. 